Hi everyone, and welcome back. In our last lesson, we explored the basics of vector arithmetic, addition and scalar multiplication. Well, it turns out that there are other operations that we can perform with vectors, and we're gonna explore those in this video. In particular, we're gonna look at norms or lengths of vectors and dot products of two vectors. For more information, check out sections 10.2 and 10.3 of the textbook. To start off our discussion, I have the following question for you. Suppose that I give you a vector in R2 with components V1 and V2. We think of that vector like an arrow emanating from the origin. The question is, what's the length of that arrow? We're going to denote this length by a special symbol. We use two absolute value bars. After all, absolute value in the real numbers is sort of a measure of size. Well, that's exactly what we're doing here. We're measuring the size of the vector V. It turns out that computing this length, which, by the way, we often refer to as the norm of our vector, uh, is not too hard. Remember, V is made up of V1 units in the x direction and V2 units in the y direction. So we can use our Pythagorean theorem. It says that a squared plus b squared equals c squared. So v1 squared plus v2 squared is the square of the length of our vector v. That is, the norm of v is the square root of v1 squared plus v2 squared. Pretty cute, huh? It turns out that the same sort of formula will emerge for vectors in R3. We would just add the third component squared here as well. So this is going to be our general definition of length for vectors in Rn. If the components are v1, v2, up to vn, we're going to define the norm of v to be the square root of v1 squared plus v2 squared all the way up to vn squared. We've just seen how to define length for vectors in Rn. Well, there are some important properties that come from that definition that I'd like to talk about. Firstly, we have this property involving scalar multiplication. If you multiply your vector by a scalar lambda, the length of the resulting vector will be the absolute value of lambda times the length of v. And this makes sense. If we multiply v by 2, we would expect it to be twice as long. What if instead we multiply it by a negative number, like, for example, minus 1? Well, according to our formula here, the length of minus v should be the absolute value of minus 1, which is 1, times the length of v. It says that the length of v and minus v are the same. And that makes sense. Minus v is just pointing in the opposite direction. Our second rule is called the triangle inequality, and it explains how norms behave with addition. It says that in general, the length of a sum of vectors, v plus w, is less than or equal to the length of v plus the length of w. To see why this is true, consider the following picture. Suppose that you're an ant trying to walk from the origin to this point over here, and you're feeling pretty lazy today, so you want to take the path of shortest distance. Well, it probably makes sense. You should walk in a straight line from the origin to this point over here. The shortest distance would be the length of v plus w. If you were to take this path, for example, going along v and then along w, that's going to be longer. The length of that path is norm of v plus norm of w. So this inequality will hold in general. Finally, the last property says that if you take any non-zero vector v and you divide it by its norm, the resulting vector will have norm 1. We call it a unit vector. For example, consider the vector v equals 2, 1. The norm of this vector is the square root of 2 squared plus 1 squared, which is root 5, and therefore this property is telling us that the length of 2 over root 5, 1 over root 5, should be 1. I'll let you verify that using the formula from the last slide. Okay, we've just figured out how to measure the length of a vector. Now let's look at a different problem. Suppose I wish to know the angle theta between two vectors v and w. Hmm, it's not so obvious how to find this angle, uh, but I'm going to use a little trick. I'm going to draw in one more line to complete this into a triangle. I'm going to label a few sides. This side I will call A, 
This side I'll call B, and this side C. Now from our cosine law, we know that C squared, C is the side opposite angle theta, is equal to A squared plus B squared minus 2AB cos theta. But hold on, we know A and B. A is the length of this vector, it's the norm of V. Similarly, B is the norm of W. What about C? Well, if you think about it, this green vector here, moving from V to W, is really the vector W minus V. Because after all, V plus W minus V should be W. This means that C is really the norm of W minus V. Ooh, now that's pretty cool, because it means that we can rewrite our cosine law as follows. C squared, that's the norm of W minus V squared, is equal to norm of V squared plus norm of W squared minus two norm of V norm of W cos theta. Pretty cool, huh? We've rephrased the cosine law in terms of vector norms. Well, now we can substitute our entries for V and W. If you do this, the norm on the left becomes W1 minus V1 squared plus W2 minus V2 squared. The square root disappeared because we squared our norm. And on the right, we have V1 squared plus V2 squared plus W1 squared plus W2 squared, and I'm going to leave the remaining term alone, minus 2 norm of V, norm of W, cos theta. At this point, we can clean up this nasty expression by expanding the term on the left and canceling with lots of stuff here on the right. I'm going to let you work through the calculations. There's no tricks here. What you'll find is that V1W1 plus V2W2 is equal to norm of V, norm of W, cos theta. Cleans up pretty nice, huh? Well, this is interesting. On the left, we have this sort of entry-wise product, V1W1 plus V2W2. This type of thing shows up often enough in vector geometry that it gets its own name. It's called the dot product of V and W. So that'll be our definition. We define the dot product of two vectors, V1, V2, all the way up to Vn, and W1, W2, all the way up to Wn, to be the real number V1, W1, plus V2, W2, and so on, up to Vn, Wn. We symbolize the dot product with this little dot between the two vectors. So I'm going to go ahead and clean up what we have on this slide and summarize what we've just observed. We've just defined the dot product of two vectors, V and W. And on the last slide, we showed that there's this really cute relationship between the dot product and the angle between the vectors. The same relationship holds in R3 as well. It says that the dot product of V and W is the norm of V times the norm of W times the cosine of the angle between them. This angle, by the way, we always measure between zero and pi. Now, before I jump into an example that uses this cool formula, I want to make one more interesting observation. Suppose your vectors v and w are perpendicular, sort of like the standard basis vectors that we saw in R2 or R3. If they're perpendicular, it means that they meet at an angle of pi over 2. But wait a second, cos of pi over 2 is 0. So the left-hand side of this expression must be 0 as well. It tells me that the dot product of two perpendicular vectors must be equal to zero. But the converse is also true. If my vectors are non-zero, but they have a zero dot product, then the right-hand side must be zero. That is, cosine theta is zero. So the vectors intersect at a 90 degree angle. They're perpendicular. What we've just argued is that if you have two non-zero vectors, then their dot product is zero if and only if the vectors are perpendicular. Now, of course, all of this is taking place in R2 or R3 because these are the settings that we can visualize. But still, we can use this connection to make a definition of perpendicular for vectors in Rn. Mathematicians actually often like to use the word orthogonal. So here's our definition. We say that two vectors V and W are orthogonal if their dot product is equal to zero. Now let's check out an example. Okay, here's an example that puts all of our knowledge to use. 
The question is, are these two vectors orthogonal? If not, what's the angle between them? Okay, well, let's think back to our definition. What does it mean to be orthogonal? Well, two vectors are orthogonal if their dot product is zero. So let's compute the dot product. The dot product of 0, 1, 1 and minus 1, 0, 1 is 0 times minus 1 plus 1 times 0 plus 1 times 1. Ah, it's 1. It's not 0. So my vectors are not perpendicular. But we can still determine the angle between them using the formula from the last slide. Remember, the dot product of two vectors is the norm of the first vector times the norm of the second vector times the cosine of the angle between them. In this case, we know that the dot product is 1. So 1 is equal to the norm of 0, 1, 1 times the norm of minus 1, 0, 1 times cos theta. Well, what are these norms? The norm of my first vector is the square root of 0 squared plus 1 squared plus 1 squared. That's root 2. The norm of my second vector is the square root of minus 1 squared plus 0 squared plus 1 squared. That's again root 2. And then we have cos theta. Well, if you simplify this, you get that cos theta is a half. Using some trigonometry, you'll find that theta is pi over 3. The vectors meet at a 60 degree angle.